the distant future, mankind has achieved countless scientific breakthroughs. A boom in research for space travel led to the creation of the jump drive. With the ability to travel to new systems, humanity would begin an expedition to colonize a cluster of systems containing vast amounts of habitable planets. This would later become known as the Frontier Systems. Prosperity would only last so long. With tensions rising, humanity would find itself on the brink of war. Decades long tensions exploded into all out war on the frontier today. The group calling themselves the Militia have conducted numerous raids on IMC garrisons in at least... Vice Admiral Grace, you and Captain McAllen have a long history of successful operations against the Militia. What do you think made him turn, Admiral? Why did McAllen betray you? Short on fuel and supplies, the first militia fleet is unlikely to survive their next encounter with the IMC battle group in pursuit. Welcome back, pilot. In today's video, I'll be going over the law for Titanfall 1. So sit back, grab your R101, and stand by for Titanfall. To make things easier, I'm going to split the video up into its own sections where I will discuss different topics. This will include the background for the frontier, the history of the conflict between the IMC and the militia, a breakdown of the militia faction and the IMC faction, and the Titanfall tech. I'll also include the main characters for Titanfall 1. So, with that being said, let's continue. In Titanfall, many generations of humanity live in the deepest reaches of explored space. This vast region is known as the Frontier. It contains many well-known and inhabited solar systems, but many more worlds remain uncharted. Most people will never travel this far away from normal civilization. The core system is closer to Earth, but for pioneers, explorers, mercenaries, outlaws and soldiers, the frontier offers both adventure and opportunity. Planetary systems in the frontier are separated by distances that can normally be traversed within days to weeks, by ships capable of making a series of jumps through space. Many systems within the frontier were discovered and settled by the IMC and its various subsidiary branches. There were many conflicting economic, military, industrial and political motivations behind the settlement programs. One major influence on the frontier was the IMC Servicemen's Readjustment Act, aka the IMC's so-called GI Bill. This was awarded to veterans of IMC-backed military campaigns in the core systems of human civilization. This gave veterans various benefits. Loans to start businesses and farms on the frontier, low-cost mortgages and guaranteed property rights on the frontier worlds to start new lives. Therefore, many homesteaders arriving on the frontier still have combat skills from their time in service and know how to handle firearms and titans. In the frontier, most systems with a naturally occurring Earth-like planet have only one such planet. Mass and distance from the local stars are usually the critical factors. The rest of the planets within such a system are usually not suitable for immediate habitation. In some cases, a planet can be altered through 60 to 100 years of terraforming to give it a breathable atmosphere necessary for unassisted human survival. The earliest colonized systems were selected for their suitability for human habitation. Possessing at least one Earth-like world, not too hot, not too cold, and capable of sustaining human life. Some of the criteria were a breathable or terraformable atmosphere, safe geological and cosmic conditions, a roughly 1G of gravity. While habitable planets do exist throughout known space, the systems containing them are rarely clustered near each other. The frontier is quite unusual in this regard. How this came to be remains a mystery. Colonization was mainly achieved by using a device called a jump drive. A jump drive allows a ship to travel very long distances in the blink of an eye. Between jumps, a ship is vulnerable to attack as it plods along using basic thrusters while the jump drive recharges. 
Recharging can take anywhere from a few seconds to several days, depending on the size of the ship and the distance of the jump. The drives require especially refined fuel in order to recharge, and on long series of jumps, there is a real danger of being stranded without fuel if the ship does not end up within range of a refueling ship or station. The most famous station is the IMC's port of Demeter, which lies on the only jump route between the core systems and the frontier. So, with the background complete, let's head over to History of the Conflict. When the frontier was first discovered, the IMC funded numerous expeditions to explore and colonise the new worlds. Over time, the novelty of these initial discoveries wore off. Without a steady stream of constant revelations, interest in the frontier exploration waned amongst the majority of humanity in the core systems, and IMC's support for the frontier development went in decline. Soon thereafter, a number of major conflicts in the core systems took priority over the IMC's interest in the frontier, and the IMC effectively abandoned all investment in its frontier expeditions. For several generations, life on the frontier continued with minimal connection to the IMC and the core systems. When the IMC finally turned its attention back to its original colonies on the frontier, their envoys had discovered that the descendants of the pioneering expeditions had flourished independent of the support from the IMC. Many worlds on the frontier had been colonised and access to plentiful resources was commonplace. Struggling to meet consumer demands in the core systems and seeing a wealth of new resources on the frontier, the IMC declared imminent domain citing their investments dating back to the original expeditions. They sent large fleets to establish control of the region, building new manufacturing and mining operations, often displacing established frontier citizens in the process. After years of failed diplomacy, the citizens of the frontier had endured enough. They put aside their differences to fight the IMC and formed the militia. Today, the many branches and factions within the militia continue to fight for independence from the IMC's exploitation of the frontier and its people. While the question of who is right and who is wrong in this conflict is arguably a matter of historical perspective, one thing is certain, this conflict will continue until either the militia is wiped out or the IMC withdraws from the frontier. So, with the history discussed, we're going to move on and talk about the two main leading factions within this universe. The Militia. The Frontier Militia represents the military arm of the Frontier System's Territorial Defence Pact. The Militia is a loosely governed mishmash of homesteaders, bandits, mercenaries and pirates, all rising up as citizen soldiers when the need arises. Many homesteaders have taken on a if you can't beat them, join them attitude regarding working alongside different criminal groups. Naturally, the people in this melting pot don't always see eye to eye on how to deal with the IMC's exploitation of the frontier, but they are unified in fighting against it. The militia is loosely divided into brigades. Each brigade is responsible for fighting an assigned section of the frontier territory which might span as far as several planetary systems. The Marauder Corps, M Corps, is a small part of a much larger brigade tied to the Freeport system. Although some brigades are little more than vast pirate organisations, the militia has enough resources to be a real obstacle to the IMC's ambitions on the frontier. The militia often claims that direct action against the IMC is in the best interests of the homesteaders who they allegedly represent but not everyone on the frontier sees it that way. Now this has been said, let's move on to the key characters within the militia. Macallan, they call us terrorists, or worse, but we can't win playing by their rules. A highly decorated veteran of the Titan Wars, Macallan served as the executive officer for the IMS Odyssey, under the command of Vice Admiral Marcus Graves. The Odyssey's mission was part of a peacekeeping operation on the frontier, for the IMC. Official IMC reports indicate that McAllen led a mutiny aboard the Odyssey 15 years ago, citing numerous grievances within the IMC's treatment of the frontier citizens. 
However, these reports have not been proven in the absence of the ship's flight data recorder, which was lost when McAllen and his people escaped with the Odyssey and disappeared into an uncharted sector of the frontier, Bish. We trace the modification. Hammond Robotics has a weapons division. The name Bish is short for Bishamon, the mythological god of warriors within the Japanese Seven Gods of Fortune. Bish is an IMC trained electrical engineer, born and raised on Earth. After getting screwed over by the IMC on a frontier job placement that cost him all of his savings just to move out there, he ended up in the right place at the right time, the notorious Bish Barbara, to take the militia's timely offer of employment. Bish now serves as a combat intel specialist, remote hacking into IMC systems during combat on behalf of ground forces, tracking mission progress and giving tactical guidance to pilots on the ground. Sarah, you saw those machines fight. We need an answer and we need it fast. As a child, Sarah lost several close members of her family to incidents in which the IMC displaced frontier citizens by force. As a result, she vowed to take revenge on the IMC at every possible opportunity, refusing to rest until they have been removed from the frontier. For most of her career, she served in covert operations for the militia, before moving into command ranks of the militia's Marauder Corps. Her long list of successful attacks on IMC installations landed her on the IMC's high-value target list, where she remains listed as one of the top 50 most dangerous military operatives still at large. Barker. Wait, we have to get back. I left my shotty at the bar. I ain't leaving town without it. Barker served with McAllen during the Titan Wars, a series of conflicts within the core system many years ago. Their operations during the Titan War have been chronicled in many historical records and have formed the basis of the current IMC counterinsurgency doctrine. A tremendously gifted pilot of both Titans and all things flying, Barker is rumoured to have adjusted poorly to life outside of combat, sinking into a deep depression and becoming even more of an alcoholic than he was during active service. So, that's the full militia breakdown complete, let's move on to the IMC. The IMC, the Interstellar Manufacturing Corporation, or IMC, started out small in natural resource extraction industries under the name Hammond Engineering. Fifteen years later, the demand for titan manufacturing materials combined with Hammond's market concerning planetary survey technology and map database rights contributed to explosive growth for the company. Over the course of a century, a series of acquisitions mergers and rebrandings led to the transformation of Hammond Engineering into the sprawling commercial empire that is the IMC. Despite their reputation for exploitive behaviour on the frontier, they received little criticism from their shareholders and customers living in the core systems. The material conveniences and widely used products provided by the IMC generate considerable consumer inertia to the corporation's benefit. With the frontier's valuable shipping lanes and vast planetary resources ripe for exploitation, the IMC is dedicated to maximising profits and shareholder wealth, using the legal application of force when necessary. So with that said, let's look at some of the key characters within the IMC. Graves. Sometimes rank has its privileges. In the IMC command structure, Vice Admiral Graves is formally known as Sinfront, or Commander-in-Chief, Frontier Command. Despite the elaborate title, Frontier operations are notorious for their lack of adherence to traditional protocol, allowing Graves to personally command IMC forces in the field, and to operate far more informally than commanders in the core systems. Graves has a reputation as a maverick within the IMC, his calls for policy change have often been deemed too risky to the IMC forces and too lenient to the frontier citizens. During the inquiry into the Odyssey's scandal, Graves maintained that the ship was forcibly commandeered by McAllen and his band of mutineers. Cuban Blisk 
You kill me, you're better. I kill you, I'm better. Bilisk is a South African mercenary working under a new long-term contract with the IMC on the frontier, providing combat intel and counterinsurgency services. His first contract concluded with his outfit making enough money to retire to a tropical paradise. But after considering the excellent pay and more importantly, the opportunity to lay waste everything in sight with state-of-the-art hardware, Blisk decided that the IMC's offer to renewal was just too good to pass up, and so he continued fighting under the command of Vice Admiral Graves. Spyglass. A pilot survived the aftermath. Find out how to bring him and his Titan to me. Spyglass is a physical manifestation of the IMC's vast computational network identity, handling logistics, navigation, deployment and communications between all IMC forces on the frontier. Spyglass units are built on a modified Spectre chassis and are considered expendable in the field, often accompanying ground forces aboard dropships to provide up-to-date mission information and live surveillance. So, now that we've discussed key characters and the background for the militia and the IMC, let's move on and talk about units and tech commonly deployed by both the militia and the IMC. Both factions have access to a large variety of different tech and equipment to use on the battlefield or the frontier. To start off, we'll be talking about pilots. Titan pilots are rated by certifications, most of which apply to civilian applications such as construction, shipping and heavy salvage industries. The most prestigious of these is full combat certification, a widely published series of tests that grade a Titan's pilot's abilities. Because of the extreme physical and mental challenges of mastering both Titan combat and dismounted parkour movement, a fully combat certified Titan pilot is rare to find, and the combat skills of active pilots in the field varies widely throughout the frontier. Some are formally trained by the IMC or militia's dedicated programs, while the vast majority are trained by independent mercenary or pirate groups. A large black market surrounding the technology used by pilots is rumoured to have been developed across the frontier covering areas such as weapon modifications, physical alterations and strengthening, stolen training simulation pods and Titan pilot combat interface abilities. Pilots use a variety of equipment and weapons, but are commonly seen with equipment such as jump kits and data knives. Jump kits are small jetpacks that are worn around the waist. They originated in the ship salvage industry. Workers needed a way to quickly navigate through complex geometries with deadly drops and sheer vertical faces. Jump kits provided a brief burst of thrust that is used to leap to higher locations. They also have a function that adjusts the deceleration of potentially fatal descents to safe levels, allowing pilots to fall from great heights without injury. Combat Titan pilots have informally adapted jump kits to their own purposes for many years. The jump kit enables sustained wall running, improving pilot maneuverability in combat situations against regular infantry and other titans. Data Knife This is a special knife designed to infiltrate and reprogram enemy computer systems by plugging into a data port. A circular backlit screen in the handle indicates progress. The business end of this device is a plug that works with different types of hardware ports like a skeleton key. When used against Marvin's inspectors, the data knife will program the robot to fight on the attacker's side. It also works as a knife. Titans are descendants of today's fledging military exoskeletons. In addition to the obvious combat applications, unarmed forms of Titans are used in heavy industries like cargo transport and salvage. They are also used in special applications such as deep space search and rescue and are very effective in inhospitable environments. The use of Titans is widespread throughout the frontier, both combat and civilian life. There is a large variety of different Titans deployed by both the IMC and the militia, 
they come in different classes such as Atlas, Strider and Ogre. Chassis. Choosing a chassis is the most fundamental decision pilots face when customising their title. Before selecting a chassis, they take into account the kind of role they want to play on the battlefield. There are two main factors to take into consideration, speed and durability. While the Ogre is the most durable chassis, it's the slowest. The Strider on the other hand offers speed but at the cost of less armour. Meanwhile, the Atlas fills the middle ground, offering a balance of speed and durability. Each Titan chassis also has a unique core ability, further defining their combat role. The Atlas is a workhorse of the various Titan chassis. It has served in the form of countless variants throughout the frontier for decades and will likely remain a common sight for many more to come. Despite the age of the design, its robust damage core allows it to remain competitive in battle with the more modern Titans. On the frontier, the Atlas has always performed when needed. From the first conflicts to the latest deployments, the Atlas stands the test of time. As the workhorse of the IMC Titan fleet, it has survived every encounter and mission scenario and continues to outperform competing technologies on every battlefield. The Ogre-class Titan is often referred to as Hammond Robotics 800-pound gorilla. Although the Ogre's weight and size makes it slower moving, it is very well armoured and shielded. With armour plating this thick, you won't need to run. In field testing, Hammond Robotics' newest model uses its heavy armour design to destroy the competition in ballistic and martial testing. And in the Ogre's initial deployment, it truly delivered. In total, it was responsible for 67% of enemy force depletion. It suffered only superficial damage to outer hull while mitigating damage to friendly units by nearly 40% and inflicting over 50% more damage to enemies. Strider. The Strider represents Hammond Robotics' leading design in fast attack combat systems. The Strider is unmatched in speed and agility, but carries minimal shields and armor. Using its dash core aggressively, a skilled Strider pilot can outflank enemies in a very short time, completely taking them by surprise. In field testing, the Strider outperformed all other Titans in speed acceleration and agility. But the direct action missions is where the Strider excels. As the first to strike, Strider destroys Class A defences with a 63% higher success rate and it can secure rapid deployment objectives faster than any other Titan on the frontier. Grunts, standard infantry deployed by both the IMC and the militia, are most commonly referred to as grunts, participating in battles dominated by pilots and titans. Grunts often serve with a supporting role, securing and defending objectives. Grunts are equipped with a variety of ballistic based weapons, ranging from carbines to shotguns. But some grunts also carry shoulder fired anti armor weapons designed to damage titans. Spectres, Defence Contractors subsidiaries of the IMC developed the Spectre, a robotic anthropomorphic combat system derived from the Marvin project. The Spectre is officially classified in IMC manifests as a form of automated infantry. Their main use is urban pacification and occupation. Due to the cooperation and military politics that plagued their development, Spectres inherited a data port vulnerability from their Marvin predecessors. When a pilot reprograms a Spectre, the Spectre immediately begins to seek out and engage friendly combatants, both human and artificial, with extreme prejudice. Subsidiaries of the IMC developed the Marvin, mobile, robotic, versatile entity, commonly referred to as Marvin. A Marvin is an anthropomorphic helper robot used in industrial and civilian applications. They are not designed for combat and they have relatively primitive locomotion systems compared to their Spectre counterparts. Marvins are used throughout core systems and the frontier, performing sanitation, construction, maintenance and hazardous environment duties in both industrial and civilian markets. Commanders can choose a variety of different ways of deploying units to the battlefield. The two primary methods that are used are dropships and drop pods. Dropships. The Goblin dropship is the current generation of the IMC troop and light cargo transport. It is manufactured in a variety of formats, 
each with different drive, shielding and weapon systems. The Crow is an older generation of dropship based on the battle forged and proven designs from the Titan Wars. Although it was superseded by the IMC's Goblin design several years ago, it is still seen everywhere throughout the frontier. Many Crow class dropships still remain in the service of the militia, either salvaged from the battlefield or stolen outright from the IMC. The Dropship Combat Search and Rescue DCSAR, system is a collection of modifications that allow small dropships such as the Crow and Goblin to carry several Titan grade body shield generators on board. Dropships carrying the DCSAR system are so heavily shielded that they are almost invulnerable to enemy fire, making them ideal for medical evacuation, even when under heavy fire from enemy Titans. However, the amount of power required to operate the system limits how often the ship can operate its jump drive. Usually one jump for arrival and one jump for departure before requiring refueling. Drop pods. Drop pods are used to deploy automated and human infantry to the ground from orbit with high precision. Drop pods can be pressurized for the deployment of human occupants. The pods may also be internally reconfigured in many ways to deliver a wide variety of payloads. Distortion braking technology allows drop pods to streak in but decelerate to a survivable speed prior to hitting the ground. The braking results in a visible donut-like distortion effect in the sky and a bow-shaking low frequency sound that is hard to miss. Heavy turrets. Heavy turrets are designed for killing everything, including titans. When used out in the field, they are often braced in position in urban environments atop buildings and have a considerable range of motion and excellent target tracking systems. Multiple titans are usually required to disable a single heavy turret by focusing their fire on it. They operate autonomously and in most cases can be flipped to fight for the other team when a nearby console is compromised, often with a data knife. So with all the lore discussed, I will be ending the video. I won't be including the campaign in the rest of this because I know a few people are still buying Titanfall 1, which is pretty surprising, considering it's uh, 2023. But um, yeah, I won't be discussing the campaign in case you know there's new people who want to experience it for themselves. But um, yeah, that's pretty much all the lore. All of this is read straight out of the book. I did not come up with any of it myself. But I thought it would be interesting to share some of the lore and background for the Titanfall universe that we all love and know. So if you did like the video, please consider subscribing, commenting and sharing. We much appreciate it. And I'll see you all in the next video. Take care, pilots.